Okay. Hi, Suzanne. I'm Tate Porewala. I'm going to be introducing you. Um, I can see I can see you there. All right. So welcome, everyone. We've got probably an audience of about maybe 50 people here. Um, and um, yeah, so I'd like to welcome you um, virtually um, to SOAS, to the Development Study Seminar. We have more people coming in as well. Um, and so today, uh, Professor Suzanne Soderberg from Queen's University in Canada um, is going to be presenting. And in line with the very real uh, climate emergency that is all around us. Um, we are having her present via Skype. And, and actually, the sound is actually quite, it's quite good, so I don't think that we're, we're losing anything really here either. So, so uh, Professor uh, Soderberg um, is a professor in the Department of Global Development Studies at Queen's University in Kingston in Ontario. Um, her research interests are broad and varied, and she's published quite extensively in the areas of finance, global governance, corporate power, debt, urban poverty, and state theory. Um, she's investigated these themes across many geographical spaces. So Germany, she's mentioned already, coming across, <laughs> across the global north and global south, including Latin America, Southeast Asia, North America, and Europe. Um, and amongst her publications, she's authored a number of books, including uh, two special issue editorships, and several books, including uh, Corporate Power in Contemporary Capitalism in 2010, and Debt Fair States and the Poverty Industry in 2014. And the research, which I assume has funded the, what's gone into the, the publication of this book that she's going to be presenting on, um, has been funded by the Social Science Humanities Research Council of Canada. Uh, so I'll welcome you, Suzanne, to, and if there's any technical issues, we'll, we'll step in and, and let you know. Otherwise, I think, I think we're all ready to go. Thank you so much. And thank you, Faisy, for, for, for uh, inviting me. And thank you, all of you, for coming up. This is very surreal. It's your my virgin audience Skyping uh, for a talk. But I think that's the way of the future uh, in our climate emergency. Uh, I should note that you can't really see, but in the background, <laughs> we have a snowstorm. And I, I just clicked the London Weather Network, and I realized you have a balmy 11 degrees Celsius there. So maybe I should have just skip the climate emergency <laughs> in here in person. But that said, uh, no, they're all very serious. Um, I am talking to you today about some insights from my uh, current book project, Urban Displacements, as you can see uh, from the book title. The book is still in progress, but I am wrapping it up. I see the end of the tunnel, and I hope to discuss uh, some insights that you have in terms of the rental prices in London with me um, afterwards. So that would be, I'm very excited about this. The project spanned between 2015 uh, to 2019 in terms of um, extensive field work in Berlin, Dublin, and Vienna. Uh, interviews with all types of, of stakeholders, if you will, as well as primary documentation. Um, so without further ado, let me just tell you what I'm up to today. I want to start the lecture um, just talking about some analytical frames and definitional clarity around what I'm up to with displacements. And then I'll turn to the three cases, um, Dublin, Vienna, and Berlin. And then I'll end with some reflections. Um, largely sort of give away the plot line of uh, maybe coming to grips with this concept of housing crisis that we keep hearing and trying to maybe understand that as a trope that itself needs to be deconstructed. So with that said, let's turn to the framing. And I have a picture here um, which is representative of the uh, housing situation of displacements that are occurring throughout Europe, North America, all over the world, basically. And here we have a family living in a hotel in Dublin from the age of the parents, not to be ages. Um, I don't, it just dawned on me, these are not parents, these are, I think, grandparents. And they're looking after their grandchildren, um, largely because their, their children are working and the daycare uh, facilities fees in Dublin are one of the highest in Europe. I should note that the homeless and these so-called emergency shelters in private spaces, emergency shelters in hotels in Dublin, as in Germany as well, um, don't remain in these hotels or hostels or pensions for a night. They stay there for about two years on average, right? living in one room 
with several children. It was a horrific, horrific situation. So why am I looking at rental housing? Rental housing has um, given, been given a sort of short shrift of the last decade or so, um, largely because um, home ownership, and it still is quite prevalent in many countries, especially our Anglo-American um, countries. But the rental tenure is expanding, and it's expanding quickly, largely because most people can't afford homes. Uh, and um, in, in Toronto, I know that we have somewhere up between 50% um, now rent tenure. It's growing. The numbers I checked in, in London right now are, are 40, 60, 60 in terms of home ownership. But, but according to uh, the government, in, in the UK government, this sort of home ownership rental ratio is going to split um, in a few years so that the dominant rental tenure in London will be rental, or sorry, tenure will be rental. Um, in Dublin, one of the case studies, we've seen since 2004 rental switch uh, from 2004 to now of up to 40% rental. And this is significant, significant given that in Dublin, the, uh, the primary uh, tenure was home ownership for, for quite some time. And just to say that when I'm talking about rental housing, I am talking about private rental sector and social slash public housing. But why I'm really interested in rental housing is that it's places, it represents places in which the urban poor reside, primarily, predominantly in Europe and in North America, and in which they are experiencing increasing displacement in growing numbers. And here's just a snapshot, if you will, um, with various statistics. And I should say we have to take these with a grain of salt because in many of these places, um, we don't have official collection of homelessness. So in Germany, there is no official homeless statistic. I know that it's collected in the UK. Um, it's collected in Ireland, but not so much uh, elsewhere in Europe. But the other thing is the statistics that are collected are um, based on roughly so visible homelessness, where we know that the majority of homelessness occurs couch surfing, uh, people living in cars, people living in, in hotels, etc. So the invisible homelessness, if you will, is more predominant than the physical homelessness that you see on the street, the rough sleepers. But that said, look at even the numbers here of uh, uh, we look at Ireland, 145% since 2017. I mean, the numbers here, again, are suspect. We have um, 8,854 people living in emergency accommodations, right? But today, we know, as of last year, there are over 10,000 people, right? Right now, in Europe, in those, those type of dwellings. Uh, in Germany, there's a rise of 150%. Right now, they're talking about numbers around a million, not 800,000. Uh, and half of those, and we'll get to that later in the talk, are refugees, according to, um, to statistics. And even Austria here, um, which is known, and we'll talk about this as well, as the um, model, housing model of Europe, as the world, even with its huge amounts of social housing, um, is registering 32% increase in um, rough sleepers, if you will, since 2016. And of course, England, um, there you go, you win the first place there with 169% increase in, in homelessness. It's a huge problem, right? Even if these numbers need to be taken with a grain of salt, it's big. What are the key narratives to explain the situation? There's about three of them, right? So let's look at them in turn. One is waiting for an equilibrium. And here it's sort of a play of the dominant debates in economics between supply and demand. And you know, we if if the states, and we've all heard this um, economic framing, if the states um, give the private sector, builders, you know, investors, etc., um, more incentives, such as um, low interest rate loans, um, public land with long leases. Um, et cetera, et cetera, tax rebates, they will be incentivized then to build, because they're the rational, efficient actors, to build sufficient amounts of houses to meet housing supply. 
And we've been waiting for this equilibrium since the 1990s. It has not occurred. But that is one of the dominant and prevailing policy frameworks, if you will, that is producing, in a way, and, and to a certain degree, and also governing the sort of displacement that we're seeing. The second key narrative, um, which I have a lot of empathy for, is one that is, a, if you will, a, uh, a pushback to the dominant economic framing of uh, supply and demand, which is coming more from sort of the UN Papi Todd, uh, people like um, Leilani uh, Farah, who is the um, UN Housing Repertoire for Housing Rights, Special Repertoire for Housing Rights, who uses this commodity human right duality. And the argument goes as follows. We have all these displacements because housing has become a financial asset that is speculated, you know, and et cetera, by these financial um, vultures that are coming in and raising the, uh, the prices of rent too high that people can't afford them. Um, and in order to rectify this, we have to turn housing into a human right um, in order to protect, you know, it's very, very important. Um, there's two problems with this. One is, for me at least, my perspective, is that housing has always been a commodity, right? Housing is always, from a Marxian perspective, housing under capitalism has always been a commodity. It's always like labor power, money, has use value and exchange value, or what I argue in the book, houses are places of survival, but also sites of accumulation. That has always been the case historically. There's always been displacements. There's always been a tension politically around balancing that tension of places of survival and uh, sites of accumulation. The other side of the argument that houses should be a human right, very empathetic to this stance. However, since 1966, we've had um, that sort of protection under the, the uh, UN Human Rights of Declaration. And in fact, many countries such as Mexico, Germany, et cetera, have embraced housing as a human right in their constitution. But we're still in this question is what? The third set of debates, which are more scholarly, um, are the financialization of rental housing. And here we have some excellent contributions with very rigorous um, and rich empirics one of the key leaders of, of these um, debates, leading scholars, is Manuel Albers, who's discussed um, financialization as the, the dominant sort of financial strategy and technology um, that, and discourse that's used by states, by, um, uh, by uh, companies, and by um, households themselves. And through the financialization process, right, they just sort of bordering also on human uh, housing as a commodity argument, we have these increasingly high rents that we can't afford. And, you know, like all these, these, these explanations, there's a, there's a curve of truth. My sort of a beef with the financialization debates is not so much their argument put forth as I have given sort of snapshot, but what they don't look at. And there's a tendency in financialization, and granted, it's a very large, it's a very, there's a lot of definitions about financialization, um, but their main sort of uh, blind spots are that they don't, they tend to focus more on consumption and exchange as opposed to looking at the capitalism holistically. So yes, consumption and exchange, but also production of goods and services, right? We, we live in a financialized world where we're wearing clothes, we're working on computers, we're talking through computers and things that have been produced by human labor, right? And this human labor, these low-wage people, right, for the most part, are, that are being displaced, are the tenants that we are trying to understand why and how they're being displaced. So there's this sort of connection to the production of goods and services, again, service sector being huge in our, in our world right now. And yes, there may be some um, high skilled, high wage um, uh, workers involved in, high to, in the service sectors, but the majority of the service sector workers are stuck with in-work poverty, right? Low wage contracts, voluntary part-time, long-term unemployment, we know the, the, the all of this, right? Um, but in the discussion of financialization of rental housing, labor power, and the people, you know, the people that are living in these rental units are kind of 
not talked about. And if they are discussed, they're discussed in ways of being predators and renters, again, realm of exchange, as opposed to looking at the wider class structure of capitalists and labor power. They don't theorize the power of money, and they don't theorize the state very well. And I think that these are really, really important points of neglect that need to be brought in to really understand the root causes and the reproduction of displacement. So how do I correct this? I have many chapters in the book where I went through this, but since I only have a few minutes with you today, I thought I would start with a picture. Maybe because a picture tells a thousand words, doesn't it? And in this case, in 2017, it tells a story of 27 million pounds worth of, of stories. And this one is um, starts with Burberry basically burning that amount of commodities because it was in excess of they could sell on the market, right? And this excess or surplus, I think, is really important. It's not new. People talk about surplus, especially Marxists, all the time. But I think it's an important word to pull out to start understanding capitalism and, and displacements from a different sort of angle. So instead of beginning with financial creation, I begin with surplus. And I try to think about surplus and its connection to scarcity. So, you know, we have surplus carbon. That's why I am giving this conversation through Skype. We have surplus money, right, in the form of privately created credit, um, privately created money in the form of credit, um, backed by corporations, not by the state, until all their bets fall to the wayside, and then we have our, our public money coming into back with up. But, you know, just think like 600 trillion uh, derivatives, out debt contracts and derivatives right now. That's surplus money. At the same time, we have surplus people, right? We have the, those low-wage, low-skilled workers in the service sector that I'm talking about. Those are low-wage, those are surplus people. In Marxist, Marxist terminology, relative surplus population, the underemployed and unemployed. Those are the people that are, are inhabiting, being expelled from these, these um, rental units, if you right? So, I would suggest an alternative framing where we look at displacement explicitly, inexplicably tied historically to the dynamics of capitalism. And by capitalism, I want to draw out three surpluses. One is the surplus money, right? And how the surplus money circulates around, not just, not just by buying <coughs> buildings and selling them and charging you know, higher, higher rent, but also what happens inside the buildings in terms of um, tenants becoming more indebted through credit that's available to them, right? Um, and the scarcity of low wages um, that are topped up by then other types of money, which we'll talk about in a second, through the state. I think it draws our eyes to also surplus populations, which are important, right? They're not just workers, they're also our low wage tenants. It's a connection between production exchange, work to our theorization of displacement. And social surplus. Social surplus is just a fancy word that Marxists use, or are, um, uh, surplus products, another David Harvey uses, to um, designate money that the state appropriates from capitalists and then redistributes, right? In other words, taxes, for example, right? But this social surplus becomes interesting over the last several decades because the state is distributing, dispersing most of this money to the wealthy and corporations, right? As Harvey and others have argued. And I think by looking at capitalism in this way through these surpluses, we'll have more tangible sort of an analytical and empirical sort of handhold in which to look at the politics, the social aspects, and the economic aspects of displacement, which I think are missing in the space. So a visual of, of surplus, if you will, to bring us to London, uh, Dublin right now, but it could also be London. There's 30,000 homes right now that are empty in Dublin. 30,000 homes since the financial crisis. This is a picture, again, it's not something that is out of the ordinary. It's become completely normalized. These are children that um, whose mother, largely single parents, right, could not find um, 
placed in emergency shelters, in the hostels, in hotels, and were forced to go to public spaces. In this case, it is police stations. And they slept here, for example, running in the local newspaper for a week. But again, this is not something that is out of the ordinary, right? It's become normal, which is part of the problem. Am I going too quickly? Yes or no? theoretical framework, I look at displacements and there's a few different dimensions of displacement. And one is a removal from place of security and stability. And this is both a physical displacement, like the children sleeping in the police station, or the people living in the hotel, but it's also an emotional and psychological displacement, right? When your rent increases and you have so much insecurity, stress, because you have to cut down on costs or transportation costs, et cetera, right? So displacements are visible and invisible. When I talked about the homelessness, we have the visible rough sleeper, but the vast majority of homeless are invisible, right? They're couch surfing, they're living in crowded spaces with families and friends, they're living in cars, or insecure spaces of domestic violence, right? Um, visible and invisible also relates to eviction. Right? We have formal evictions, which there's been some, a lot of research on. Um, Desmond Matthews' book, for example, but he looks at formal evictions. The vast majority of evictions are, according to the experts in the field, are invisible. So these are informal eviction notices right, that the state and the landlord put on the door of the tenant that say you need to be, you know, blah, 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 um, very legal language, and people leave. Right? They displace themselves voluntarily out of fear, out of ignorance, etc. We know that displacements involve the cycle, right? So you have over indebtedness, right? Largely because you don't have enough wages, you don't earn enough wages, right? Over indebtedness that leads to evictions, that leads then to homelessness. And we see the cycle about over and over again in these three urban spaces. And we also know that. Displacement has racial, class, and gender dimensions, right? So these <coughs> surplus populations, these tenants, have racialized class and gender characteristics. So what I'm working with in the book, in terms of a definition of displacement, is the following. Displacement is the outcome of class-based facilitation and normalization of urban poverty and social marginalization on the one side and capital accumulation on the other side. So one of the tensions I'm looking at in the book is underpinning this is what I call societal reproduction, the reproduction of capital and labor, our capitalist society, right, on one side. And there you can have household reproduction, et cetera, but societal reproduction, so that macro reproduction, and credit that accumulation, if you will, to global financial capitalism or surplus capitalism that I like to refer to on the other. Those are the tectonic plates upon which displacement moves. So where do I look in terms of displacement? I look at three cases as I mentioned. Dublin, why Dublin? Dublin is a poster child of liberal development in Europe. It had one of the fastest uh, growth rates before the crisis in 2007, 2008, and has now registered some of the highest growth rates in Europe, if not the world, to be. It also has one of the highest now rental rates in, in Europe um, to date. Vienna is chosen because it is the housing model of the world. We constantly hear this. Uh, they're amazing social commitment to social housing, where about 60% of the population reside. Um, and both Vienna and then the next case also have 85% rent of tenure, which is interesting. And this historical gap, 85% rent of tenure. Um, I look at Berlin because it's the economic powerhouse um, and stronghold of the European Union. But it's not a comparative study per se. I mean, comparative studies, you know, unsurprisingly, will show you differences. I'm more interested in the similarities. And how that similarity reveals about how we understand displacement in contemporary capitalism. So in other words, as the project 
sort of started with rental housing and displacement, I soon realized that the project was more about trying to understand capitalism through the lens of um, displacement. And to understand displacement, I had to not just look, and I can't talk about it today, but also the European level and its macro political framing of you know, wage deflation, competitive wage deflation, prioritization of economic policy over social policies. And even though it doesn't have uh, competency over housing, that's very, very important in understanding the national and urban levels of state intervention. So let's start with Dublin. We know that the Celtic Tiger from 1995 to 2007 created a lot of wealth. We know now in hindsight that much of that wealth was created through credit lead accumulation or property speculation for some. This is a lovely quote one of the um, housing activists in uh, uh, one of the public um, housing, the, the very few public housing units have left in Dublin. Uh, sort of described the Celtic Tiger years to me. We didn't see no Celtic Tiger. And indeed they didn't. The poor segments, the surplus population at that time of Dublin, um, their sort of work conditions were uh, very much so characterized by long-term unemployment, involuntary part-time, temporary and contract work. And much of this was built for women. And this type of work, rose by 165% during the same time as the Celtic Tiger. So here we go back to that Burberry image of the surplus capitalism and you know, the surplus capital alongside surplus workers. During that time, these same people started relying on debt. And in Dublin, um, an interesting phenomenon was their version of payday lending are called doorstep lenders. And interesting, there are no payday lenders that I could uh, I could find in, in Dublin or in, 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 in Ireland. Um, but they do have these doorstep lenders. And these doorstep lenders are like your payday lenders, except they knock on your door, like selling you know, old school churns and case cleaners. And they target especially low mothers and Irish travelers, right? Um, who are victims of this, you know, part of that um, low wage uh, workforce emerging through during the Celtic Tigers, or well, even before that, the uh, Dublin City Council was aggressively privatizing social housing from the mid 1990s onwards. And here I got—I want to point to the mid 1990s, right? A lot of times we talk about housing prices as you know, post austerity, post 2008, the last couple of years just gone crazy, which is not. But we see its visible roots in the mid 1990s throughout all three cases. So in this sort of post-2008 uh, post, uh, crisis phase, 2008-2018, under the ambit of austerity, Irish state continues to cut social housing, again by 72%. And by 2008 to 2018, not surprisingly, wait lists for social housing increased rapidly, with up to 50,000 people residing in Dublin area alone. And for years, right, these are the people that are living in hotels. So many on the wait list are welfare dependent households with children, most of which, uh, um, almost two thirds of which are headed by women and who experience evictions due to rental arrears, right? So that brings us back then again to over indebtedness, right? And that cycle of over indebtedness, evictions, and hopelessness. So, how has the city responded? They've responded by essentially, since they've basically axed most of the social housing, their social housing de facto is in the private rental sector. And yes, this has been normalized, right? So Dublin City Council, before 2017, and I'll talk about what happens afterwards later, subsidizes landlords by paying them directly for rent, right? So once a person um, moves from the wait list into the private rental sector where they the display, Dublin City Council cuts a check every month for these private landlords. So essentially, the craziness of it all, the Dublin City Council rebuilt this family, as I mentioned on the wait list, <laughs> in the same expensive and increasingly costly private rental tenure from which they were exposed. Right? And one of another housing activist in Dublin told me, you know, it's great. So you put poor people in new houses. 
and then what? Right? I mean, you don't have the generation of income that you're looking at. If you have low wage income, you have very, very <coughs> low social welfare protection, et cetera, because the social surplus is going towards the, the capitalists and the wealthy, for example, right? And that's also not discussed in sort of this exchange and consumption driven discussion of rental housing. So in 1918, Dublin City Council spent 118 million euros on shadow housing. And shadow housing is essentially these emergency shelters such as hotels and hospitals. They're not building public housing, okay? They are not subsidized. They're coming up with different types of ways of creating low-income housing. Instead, they're subsidizing private spaces, temporary private space, emergency shelter, or as one official uh, said, called, I think rightfully so, shadow housing, uh, to create this sort of, you know, housing, housing um, to, to deal with the disequilibrium between up and flood and housing demand, which is still a good. Let's look at the city of Vienna, move to the continent now. Maybe Vienna will give us some kinder insights into what's going on. So we know it's the most livable city due to its housing problem, but also due to its very generous um, cultural funding, state cultural funding, recreational funding, health model, etc. It is a wonderful city to live in. Um, this apparently is rooted, and they use this a lot, they gave the, the Vietnamese uh, Council, that their generous welfare system is still uh, very much so tied and informed by its socialist days of Red Vienna and its commitment to social housing. Now, I should just say as a prelude that even during Red Vienna, they, the social housing were not available to migrant workers. They were excluded from social housing, and very poor, low-skilled workers, Austrian, were not allowed to access these social housing units, even then. And it hasn't really changed. But before I get to that part of the story, let me just talk about two main components of social housing, which in which 60% of the people in Vienna reside. In. So the first component are 220,000 council flats that are owned by the city of Vienna. And this accounts for about 25% of the housing stock. These are beautiful buildings that are up, kept, up, kept, kept up in a very, very maintained, um, very well maintained um, um, places of, of survival, if you will. And the second are limited um, profit housing associations. And these are situations where you could pay a down payment. They're sort of cooperatives, but you have to bring a hefty down payment into play in order to be part of this housing cooperative. And both of these social housings really offer low rent. So for example, I think in 2018, if you were living in Vienna, you would pay something like, I don't know, 420 euro per month for your council flat. And the limited housing association, something like 420 euro. 470 euro. Very cheap in comparison. But for some, right, there's exclusions. So non native Austrians, and if you want in the discussion period, we can talk about what non native German and non native um, Austrians mean. But non native Austrians right now refer to EU citizens, so mainly those from Eastern Europe, mainly Serbia, and non EU migrants, Turkey, that I'm just. Um, were invited in in 1960s the guest uh, worker program were excluded from housing until 2006. The poorest of the poor, and this includes native Austrians, are not um, allowed or excluded from uh, 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 generally from council housing. And by by there is a income gap or a income floor for the. Um, council housing and the, um, the housing associations. And that is about 40,000 euro a year, which puts um, the earners that are living, the tenants that are living in these, these social housing at the top 20% income scale in Vietnam, right? So not only are you racially discriminated until 2006, but also in terms of class, in terms of income. There is a hefty down payment requirement for limited profit housing associations that I mentioned, which in itself is an exclusion for the poor. Uh, 
So Austria's entry into the European Union in 1995 coincided also with the restructuring of its rental housing, right? So the competition law was uh, brought up by those that very much so want to see the destruction of social housing, especially in Vienna, um, and, and the liberalization of private rental housing. And in a way, they got what they wanted, um, and also there were segments in the Vienna Council that were very much so in favor of, of this liberalization as well. In 1996, there was moratorium for the construction of any new council flat. So those 220,000, there remained 220,000. There hasn't been one council flat added to that since 1996. And what we have then are the limited profit housing associations are the only sort of segment of social housing in Vienna that can expand. And if you recall, you need about 40,000 euro a year income in order to, to maintain, um, to be invited in or to be approved for a down payment, uh, for down payment to live in these uh, so housing associations. So the other option then for people that can't afford the council flats or are, can't, are on this huge waiting list or are not allowed in or the limited private housing association are the private rental sector. And that's where the majority of the low-income households reside. But at the same time, since 1996, the um, Austrian government has been able to play around with and make more flexible private rental prices, which means they're moving northwards. So what are the profile of displacement in Vienna? Migrants are three times more likely to be employed than native Austrians. But migrants, on the other hand, same as in Germany, migrant workers and those with a migrant background, account for 44% of the total Viennese population. And in fact, in 2017, the third most popular baby name in Vienna was Mohammed, which shows you a shifting demographic of what's going on in terms of Vienna. Single mothers and low-skilled native Austrians are not residing for social policy, and they're also vulnerable to displacement. So, in much of the literature, they say that people, the housing experts say that people that are entering the housing market after 1996, after the moratorium of social housing, council housing, for example, are sort of now locked out of that type of lovely Vienna housing model. And the number of people seeking different counseling services has increased over the new millennium as well, right? And this also includes many of these people here, the migrants, single mothers, low-skilled native Austrians, etc. However, the majority of debtors are migrants. Um, and the uh, state-led uh, debt counseling services, which there's one present in each um, of the three uh, urban centers that I just uh, researched in, were saying that you know, whenever migrants arrive in Vienna, and this is a long-term um, official that I spoke to, so he's been for several decades. Whenever people sort of emerge migrants uh, arrive in Vienna, it takes seven years until they end up in his office. So he was saying the refugees that entered um, into Vienna in 2015, by 2022 expects uh, serious Afghan people from Iraq to be sitting in his office as well. Right? And this is because what is just too high, pay is too low, right, in our surplus cap. <coughs> so we have third case study. Good. The best for last. So Berlin is the powerhouse of Germany, but it's also known as the homeless capital of Germany. It also registers some of the highest over indebtedness rate in, in Germany. And in Berlin in the 1990s, as you can imagine, it was going through a lot of financial turbulence. It was dealing with the double whammy of high debt burdens due to reunification. And it was dealing with, like many cities, the devolution of housing from federal to the urban scale. But Berlin was interesting in another way. In 2001, it was the place where um, the largest banking crisis in post-war Germany occurred. And this building here, this building of the then uh, Berlin Gesellschaft uh, no, Bank Gesellschaft Berlin, BGP, which was a large savings and loan uh, institution. The Berlin government owned 56% shares in this, in this institution, 
and use those revenue streams to finance a lot of its infrastructure pro projects that it needed for reunification. But due to some risky financial and specifically real estate deals, um, this BGB institution went kaboom in 2001. The federal government said to the Berlin Senate, or Berlin government at that point, we will not bail you out. And Berlin was now saddled with this huge debt, which is socialized. And, the, and I have a quote here from Der Spiegel, which is a weekly magazine in Germany. At that point in 2001, Der Spiegel said, and I quote, this, this socialization of, of banking debt based on risky real estate speculation would cause social conflicts on an undreamt of scale. And they were correct. In order to finance its, its debt, Berlin sold 13 of its 19 municipal uh, housing companies, which basically provided social housing for Berliners. The remaining six were then subject to uh, managerial logic, right? The, the economic efficiency, you know, all this sort of, you know, rationalization, you know, what, what universities are going through right now. And essentially meant that they would then move away from uh, keeping rental costs low to then moving from an ethos of rent maximization. There were several sort of instances where these um, municipal housing companies over the last several years have registered higher rent rates than the private rental sector. This alongside, at the same time, rising unemployment and underemployment in Berlin caused a lot of displacements. And the austerity, I mean, 2001, right? Berlin has, you know, austerity in 2001 it began in 2000, uh, post 2008. <laughs> So 2001, there was an increase in rental payments coupled with precarious labor market conditions, which resulted in displacement. High levels of over-indebtedness in the form of rental arrears, but also um, heat debt is big in Berlin as well, amongst older people, results in evictions and hopelessness. Racialized migrants, so Roma, Turks, and Serbians, both men and women are overrepresented in these cycles of displacement more than their native German counterparts. And this is especially true of stigmatized boroughs such as Neukölln, but also now Mitte, where displacement is more um, widespread than other districts. And in fact, Neukölln, you know, the special um, stigmatization that the uh, finance minister, former finance minister, Scherbner, which we probably all know from the last round of austerity, um, referred to this borough as the slums of Berlin. Now, this borough, especially in Neukölln, I should say, are comprised of 43% migrants. That includes people with migrant backgrounds. And both uh, Neukölln and Berlin, 43.5% of the children growing up in these boroughs are living in households that are dependent on social assistance. And in fact, the hearts for social assistance for unemployment in Germany Many of the people that are reliant on this are suffering from inward poverty. They're not unemployed. They're employed, right? Um, and just to give you a sort of concrete number of what 43.5% means, if you're living on a heart score, which single mother, that means that they basically can allocate four euro per child per day for food. That's not a lot of money. This is in the richest, one of the richest countries in Europe. In its capital city. Remember that bank, the BGB? Well, the BGB now becomes the office for refugees. Um, and I just don't tell me I was in an uh, interview with this newly formed um, refugee office in 2017, and I thought the building looked familiar, and it did. It was the BGB. They refurbished it and uh, are now dealing with trying to manage displacements amongst refugees. They've since moved, but at that point, they were in that building. 2015, against the backdrop of all this displacement that I was talking about, in 2015, 55,001, the German mentality there, the precision is wonderful, and one refugee, tapering off to 16,889 in 2016. 
which is still the largest number in Europe. It received the largest amount of refugees than any other city in Europe. And these refugees have to confront internal displacements already occurring and have been occurring for various several decades. In terms of housing for these refugees, there's three types of dwellings available. There's emergency shelters, there's communal uh, community accommodation, and there's rental housing. Now, I don't need to talk about the low chances of refugees accessing either uh, social housing in the six municipal housing companies that have zero vacancy, or the private rental sector whose prices are going through the roof. But let's look at what they do not want. They have emergency shelter. These were, I think, all over the newspapers and, and uh, media, news media in 2015. And we can see that Germany had no extra space or unwillingness. I guess surplus houses that we talked about in Dublin. There were surplus houses also in Berlin. But they were placed in gymnasiums and airport hangar, etc. Um, these type of cubicles. And it was supposed to be for a short period of time, but you know, even to this day, there are several emergency shelters still in operation in Berlin because there's not enough place to situate to, to put these, to place these these refugees. These emergency shelters were largely run by for-profit agencies, NGOs, and the dismal here's the pictures I received from a grassroots organization of bed bugs, you know. There were reports of, of uh, violence against women and children. It was just an awful, awful place to be. Every time you entered one of the shelters, you had to go through mass security screening, showing passports or all kinds of um, uh, identification. There were curfews. There were limits on the type of food that was available. It was just not a great place to live at or still live. Now, I should say, even though they were profit, many of them, the German state subsidized so the social surplus, if you will, in this case, are subsidizing these emergency shelters. Now, the, on, on advice of McKinsey and Company, which the Berlin government paid a whack load of money to, to help them with the refugee and housing crisis, uh, they came up with this wonderful plan to create communal shelters and build. Now, they gave up on rental housing themselves, knowing that's not going to be an option. So one of the options are these communal shelters, and here's a picture of one. And these are essentially like university residents, if you will, right? So you have um, several families or individuals sharing um, communal kitchen, bath spaces, um, and living spaces, right? So there's no, uh, they're not flat, not themselves, just communal, right? As the name suggests. Um, and they're not in any way um, appropriate for medium long-term survival, right? They're just not, right? Because there's no in these type of communal shelters. And there have been reports of, of, you know, and they're very much so policed, so you have to be in, you have to abide by the rules that are set in these communal you know, shelters in terms of noise, of course, right? And you have to, uh, there's time curfews, there's, there's been reports of, especially young refugee men that have been thrown out of these community shelters to be homeless because they came too late, for example, right? So they're very disciplinary spaces of them. The so, so, Suzanne, can I just ask you to wind wind up in the next two, three minutes? Hey! Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. So temple homes, container homes, is another um, another uh, solution to the, the housing crisis, the refugee housing crisis. Um, and here's a picture that I took, I was not allowed to take them, of Temple Homes, 38 degrees Celsius last summer. There's no air conditioning, no ventilation, and yet here we have these homes built all over Berlin. Okay, I am going to wrap up very quickly and get to the reflections. So, um, Mayor of Leipzig, I don't like to use the term refugee crisis. We don't have a refugee crisis, we have a housing crisis. My reflections of all of this is to say, let's decentralize housing crisis. The housing crisis has its roots in the 1990s. It's been around for a long, long time, right? I mean, you have a midlife crisis that lasts shorter than this, right? Crises are not just ruptures and emergencies. There's also yield order rationality in capitalism, which needs to be theorized. There's modes of governance that I think we 
we don't really capture with neoliberalism, right? Um, this dis dis of displacement, this disciplining, politicizing, disappearing people um, and, and structural violence that underpin it all. Even in the face of, of, of struggle, there is all kinds of um, all kinds of depoliticization occurring. And here's the most obvious. Housing crisis is completely normal. Every country in Europe has equivalent issues in terms of affordable housing, uh, in terms of affordability, and in terms of housing. And again, they take this for policy <coughs> that equilibrium, supply and demand, apolitical, ahistorical framing, um, and completely right, remove all kinds of questions of power. And I just want to say, and we'll, I have examples from, from various cities in terms of um, displacement, so disappearing of displacement. In Dublin, they created their solutions. You had temple homes, the communal dwellings in, in Germany. Their solution is, again, not building public housing, social housing, but building family hubs. They have, since 2017, uh, 22 family hubs, which are basically poor. Right? So you have primarily single mothers and their, their children living there with social welfare uh, uh, caseworkers around the clock that are disciplining them into becoming the deserving working poor people, deserving poor. They changed their type of rental assistance program to a housing assistance program in 2017, in which the people on the waiting list were responsible individualization, responsible to go and find their own rent rental uh, accommodation, the private rental sector, and apply to the Dublin City Council for rent and pay their landlord that rent, right? The rents are 36% higher in Dublin than they were during the apex period of, of uh, the Celtic Tiger, right? And the, the type of rent, uh, the, the amount given by the Dublin City Council to these people is not sufficient, right? And there's all kinds of depoliticizing we can talk about. Um, Berlin as well. And how these erasers don't look at power politics within capitalism. And so my last slide would be to suggest that we start interrupting crisis, the housing crisis, by identifying and problematizing the structural violence underpinning displacement, which is surplus capitalism, right? Um, including the role of the state therein. We question the class, racial, and gender features of displacement. And we make visible the disappearances and repoliticize the depoliticize. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's excellent. Just, I think, one minute over the, our time. So that's very good. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, I'm going yeah, to uh, just uh, get, well, I think this is me. Yes. Um, yes. There we go. OK, yeah. yeah. Great. Excellent. Thank you. So yeah, we can see you, but you can't see us. <laughs> no, I can see now. Okay. Okay. You can. Okay. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, we have the roving mics around that will pick up voice. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So would would anyone like to? Ask a question or make a comment on anything that's I'm also presented. interested in comments of your experiences in London and in other parts of the UK as well. Yeah, okay. Yep, we've got one right here. Paul Hudson, thank you very much indeed for your talk. Um, there are two aspects of it I was interested in. I'll just deal with the first aspect and perhaps after somebody else has asked a question. Sorry. Can you hear me now? I can hear you perfectly. Okay, thanks. Um, everybody else? Okay. Right. Um, you're referring to the um, homelessness in Germany. I was a little bit surprised about that because when I worked in Germany, that was in the early 1990s, in the, the, for the first few years of this century, Every town or region actually had what they call a, a, a living allowance. For example, mm -hmm. Berlin and München. In fact, they would be quite equivalent to the London allowance. Mm -hmm. Whereas in somewhere like Wilhelmshaven, which is in the middle of nowhere, in fact, it's near mm -hmm. the North Sea, in fact, that also had a living allowance, which might surprise me. So has that actually disappeared before a lot of the... Um, publicly owned housing, in fact, was actually sold off to uh, 
to... Would that be the main cause, in fact, of the, of the homelessness or not? Should we, okay. take, should we take another one or two while we're going around? Sorry, I just, you said you there were two aspects. So there was a homeless in Germany around the 1990s. Um, but what was the second aspect? Sorry, I didn't. Yeah. Yes, the other thing I wanted to ask you, I don't know um, what has actually happened here in this country, and I don't know whether it's a similar phenomenon, mm. but since Mrs. Thatcher, who used to be the Prime Minister of this country, whatever it was, about 40 years ago, she started selling off council houses. Mm -hmm. Now, two years ago, I heard that nearly 80% of all the social housing that have been sold off in Britain since Mrs. Thatcher's time, 80% of that housing is now in the hands of just four property companies. Mm -hmm. So you've got a cartel operating, but I don't know whether you have a similar situation in other mm -hmm. parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Excellent questions. Yeah. Okay. Should we take, we'll take three questions? Is that, is that a case? Is that, or? Yeah, yeah Okay, okay, sure. So one here. Uh, okay, okay one, um, one there, and then, then you next. Okay, um, I want to refer to what you said about the um, financial crisis in Germany in 2001 mm -hmm. that led to the collapse of one of the major financial institutes there. Mm -hmm. that um, wh why it wasn't proposed to them that to adopt the, the um, policy that was followed during the Great Depression in the 1930s when they had mm -hmm. that Keynes theory of going to the construction industry to build houses and it will have like a cumulative positive effect on the overall economy as you go further. So that's what I want to ask. Okay. okay. Um, thank you. One more? And one more. Then you can take all three. Is that that's okay? Yeah. Hey, Suzanne, thank you for your talk. Um, I just was listening to this and thinking, it, it strikes such a bell with me, being from the Bay Area and hearing about homelessness. What differences do you see between these European cities and the way that social housing is approached in displacement is approached versus places in the Americas. Because in San mm -hmm. Francisco, there's also a huge housing shortage. There aren't enough places for people, and it's not just displacing the lower class, but also the middle class, and even mm -hmm. you know, the lower bourgeoisie mm -hmm. in some places. You, you cannot mm -hmm. afford even a vacant lot for less than half mm -hmm. a million dollars. Um, mm -hmm. Is that a similar dynamic in these socialized cities, or is this a completely separate entity and a different version of neoliberalism? Awesome. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start with the first one. I think two aspects, so talking about homelessness in Germany. I, most of you know, my research has always been sort of based on the global south and U.S. I, I cut my teeth in Germany as a PhD student. I studied it in Berlin, or in, in, in Frankfurt. And I always thought, you know, in the 1990s, I always thought that Germany was so boring to study, right, compared to writing questions of okay, because it was just such wealthy, affluent, and even the poor were taken care of, right? When I arrived in 2015 in Berlin, the time that also the refugees were emerging, I was shocked. I, was, I went to interviews about social housing, I wanted to see what was going on in social housing, and I was shocked at poverty that I saw. I was shocked at the hopelessness of social workers, of NGOs, of the huge amounts of, of yeah, poverty from the state. It was completely broke at that time, they'd say. Um, of course, their social surplus was withheld for other, other interests. I went into a homeless shelter, um, a 12 month open, I, my German now, I'm getting old, but a homeless shelter, all year round homeless shelter for women, just women. In a city with 3.5 million people, guess how many beds this shelter had? It was the only shelter for women for 12 months, or for all year over shelter. Nine beds. And this story just played itself out over and over and over again in the city. Abject poverty. But then there's also this sort of racialized pockets of poverty, right? Or within Neukölln or Mitten. 
right? Um, 43% migrant, 25% unemployment rates amongst migrants, right? And so to answer your question, yeah, in the 1990s, they were okay, right? Looking at a larger sort of scale of the EU at that time, we have 1995, the single European market opening, it, freedom of goods, services, capital, especially finance. Right? Which also put that labor laws and put pressure on all types of regulation, right? And we saw then at that point too that Germany was starting to liberalize a lot of its, its finances, which caused this, this GB crisis as well. <sighs> Financialization debates don't capture the fact that the, the, the production of surplus capital, if you will, right? Surplus money emerges also on the backs of surplus people. So if we take that frame and go back to Germany in the 1990s, we also see an increase in low wage, low, um, low wage service sector work, right? It's increasing in Germany and the discrepancies among racial and gender lines is huge, right? So that continues, continues, continues. We have in the selling off of social housing in the 1990s, Germany, which I didn't know either, that was shocked, Germany sold off more social housing than Thatcher ever did. 1.8 million units, right? Faster and larger than, than Thatcher. Then in, in 2000, mid-2000s, we had the hard for labor reforms, workfare state, which took away all these social housing, housing allowances that you talk about um, and that were there. And you were right to point that out. And what happens with hard for is that the federal job sectors which operate at the urban level, um, hand out social assistance, and they will also hand out housing assistance, but based on a very tight rental index, which doesn't meet the, the needs of the rent, people who are renting right now, because rents are too hot. So there's not enough money um, dispersed by the state through work fair to help these people, and they don't have any jobs. The jobs are terrible. They're, there's a minimum wage in Germany, but it's not in full. And many of these people, especially with such amounts of surplus population, you just, you pay what you want. As an employer, it's a great place to open up a business. Um, in terms of cartels, absolutely, I didn't get to the, supply, uh, the, the slide, but Deutsche Wohnung owns 1. 160,000 flats in Germany. And right now there's a grass, grassroots initiative um, to uh, nationalize uh, Deutsche Wohnung, to buy back those houses. Um, that were sold off to Deutsche Wohn um, in 2001 to uh, the, the, private, the public uh, municipal uh, housing uh, companies. Uh, I don't think it's going to get anywhere, but I'm, you know, I, I'd like to be pleasantly surprised. But that's, cartels are not everywhere, right? So Dublin, the majority of the landlords are not these financialized landlords, they're ma and pa landlords, right? And a lot of them are politicians that own three or four houses, right? So that's interesting as well. And for, in Vienna, you, know, you do have a cartelization of, of, of landlords as well in this. But it's very nuanced, right? And if I just may go on, may I go on for one second? Okay, the, the, in, in these sort of social housing complexes, they call it, in, in, in Neukölln, where you have something like Gropiestadt has 55,000 residents, right? And they're just these blocks of, used to be all social housing. You have a mix of public housing landlords and social housing <laughs> private landlord, um, but some of the private landlords charge less rent than the public housing landlords. Some of the private landlords actually are better landlords in terms of maintenance than the, the, the uh, within public housing landlords. So there's all kinds of, of, of complexities on the various sort of geographies of surplus population. Um, the second question, the BGB, I would defer to absolutely that would be a great <laughs> <laughs> Great solution, but we are working within the dominant neoclassical paradigm of waiting for that equilibrium of supply and demand, and how dare we sully the rationality of the market forces by, by intervening through state intervention, right? Plus, I have to draw your attention again to the EU, the competition laws, etc., that were in place, that anyone that wanted to contest that could then displace the contestation to the EU, and the EU would then side on capital that this would not be the adequate way to move forward in terms of dealing with the solution. And the third point is 
European city. Absolutely happening everywhere. Toronto is a mess. Um, the Bay Area, terrible, right? Um, and you know, I have to go back because we're reading Engel's housing question the other day, and he said, you know, I'm paraphrased because it's very wordy, but he said, you know, the poor have always, the working poor and the lower working classes have always been displaced. But it, when the bourgeoisie started being displaced, that we start talking about housing, you know, the 19th century. And, you know, I mean, people are starting to pay attention, it's starting to be very, very, you know, politicized. But I think within the larger framing of this predominant, you know, um, equilibrium of housing as, as, as market, right? And enabling markets to work, right? It's sort of World Bank blueprint that's been around since 1953. It's incredibly depoliticizing, right? And we've always only gone through so many decades of individual, internalizing, individualization, responsabilization. Uh, we're all under massive stress with debt, which is incredibly individualizing and, and sort of own mechanism of shamefulness, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really hard, and this is a, a social power money that I talk about, right? It's really hard to bring a collectivity back into play, to push against. I'll end with the example of Red Vienna, right? Even though they excluded, and there's always exclusion, right? Red Vienna which created a really amazing project of these beautiful social housing units that Vienna should be very proud of, right? 220,000 of them, which is still the same number. <laughs> but that didn't emerge through a socialist project. Actually, the government squashed a revolutionary project at that time um, and created a social democratic compromise because labor was so strong at that point in time, right? Labor was strong. And they pushed the government to tax corporations. They taxed luxury taxes. They said they paid for those council flats, right? And that's what's sort of missing. We go back to that. No, no political. There's no collectivity. But there is, is. I just think that a lot of times the focal point debates that I, I mentioned at the beginning of the of the talk, right? The financialization for one of them. Housing, the right versus the commodity, right? Um, the sort of more progressive debates take our focus away from important questions that we need to be asking as well, right? Um, and how this is all implicated. So, so my final conclusion in the book is pretty dismal, but I basically say that displacements offer a solution to the immediate crisis that's going on, if you want to call it crisis, it has been a solution since the 1990s, right? This is our normality. It's going to continue, and it's going to continue on that until it can happen. But I don't see where that's going to happen right now, given the power that the state has in terms of normalizing its social surplus to corporations. We're all, we all talk about the rising, um, and the, the, what do you call it, the uh, Social economic divide, income inequality, and we all felt that. I mean, we completely numb to that. Climate crisis. Now we're calling it an emergency, but nothing's happening, right? And we have to attribute that not just to the lack of politicization, because we have it. You guys, the UCU, are showing this, right? Um, our teachers here, elementary and high school teachers, are striking today. I mean, this is this is huge. It's huge, huge pushback. But there's something out there that keeps deep politicizing all of this pushback and disappearing and, 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 and inviting us into, socializing us into the surplus capitalism. You know, um, so I think this is a normalization and I think we're all part of this and this is the at least temporary solution until, I don't know, the roof blows off the house. I don't know if that's an answer to your question. But I just tried to my head thinking, it's been going on since the 1890s. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm looking at these policies, just axing and axing and axing and pushed more and more to the private sector. And it's like, okay, okay, okay. I guess I can't buy them all. Oh well, right? Sorry, but it's it's it's, it's yes, it's a phenomenon global. Um, but it's been going on for a very long time. Just ask people living in Mexico City or you know, <laughs> well, displacement, etc. We can take and take one more round of questions. Are there any? One right here. 
Thank you for your talk, and uh, I think I can totally relate uh, to the crisis, well, especially in London, actually, coming from abroad. Uh, I think you have a very interesting population here, like students, where edu right to education apparently is a human right, but that's inextricably linked to housing, right? Like, if you cannot live here, also cannot do your education. Um, so I guess... Um, um, if housing then is not a human right, but it, rather a commodity, um, what about that middle ground? And you talked about how um, Deutsche Wohnen or something uh, buys back uh, property. So sort of like, yeah, so I guess it becomes a public um, area instead of a human right. Um, and then it made me think about the relation to Airbnb as well. So... Um, the city is not for residents, but it's for... So housing apparently comes a commodity to make money, for example. Mm. Um, I don't know if there's a question, but I <laughs> wanted to know your thoughts on this. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, so the way in the book I, I conceptualize commodity, or housing as a commodity under capitalism, is, you know, use value exchange value, right? So that I say it's a place of survival and a site of accumulation. And it's always been that way. To become more of a place of survival, like Red Vienna, there had to be, um, there are material conditions in which the state, capitalist state, and um, uh, capital uh, come to an agreement in order to say, okay, we will take part of that social surplus, you can appropriate that money from us and distribute it for this purpose, right? Um, and we've had that for decades, right, under Keynesianism, as the former uh, person um, mentioned. And you are absolutely right, Airbnb, these are all then, you know, next generation, 2.0 of, of how this sort of place of survival inside of accumulation is happening. But funny story, actually not funny, um, tragedy, actually tragic story, is that people in Berlin, for example, the very few that actually had rental housing before all of this happened um, and could afford, or, you know, barely afford to, to maintain their rent, are um, themselves entering into B&B &B, uh, relationships. So they all sleep on a friend's couch for a week in order to receive the income for their rent for that month, right? So there's this, there's this again, this normal like, okay, we'll just move and shift and use this in our, in our benefit as well, right? But the status quo continues and deepens. Um, so going back to your question of, of the, the uh, referendum in Berlin, Absolutely. So people, and what was interesting is this was triggered as well by the, the refugee crisis, right? That made more visible the type of, of uh, lack of housing for people, right? So well, unfortunately, one of the key actors, I, I'm assuming, I read some stories, uh, London was like this as well, but Vienna, um, other cities in, in Europe were very much so. Grassroots organizations were the ones the go-to organizations, not the NGOs, grassroots organizations that just stood up and said, let's get some houses for these refugees, even if it's only temporary. So people were housing refugees in homes for free, right? There were people driving around saying, you know, I'll volunteer my car, just go pick them up, get them away from that, that awful, you know, lineup and the newborn babies, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this raised a lot of political awareness amongst Berliners of this huge problem that the visible homelessness that was occurring. Right? And so it took this sort of political push from the outside to sort of say, whoa, let's, let's really do something. Not that they didn't know this was going on. Of course they did. Uh, but this really galvanized sort of other actors um, and groups into a larger project. So the 19, I think November 2019, uh, these groups uh, created, you know, tenant organizations, NGOs, grassroots organizations, created this um, referendum and ICNO, which is basically the nationalization of Deutsche Wohnen, which is this huge cartel in Berlin, and in Germany. And they, in the constitution in Berlin, um, they have to pass so many signatures. So, I don't know, they need 55,000 signatures to a certain date, which they got. Then they need now to get the second stage, 77,000, et cetera, et cetera. There's problems with that, though, in the sense that not, not in the energy and the, the spirit of that, I totally agree with it. I'm looking at it by this, this macro politics that are going to squash this initiative. And one of them is the pushback of the legal structure, the same legal structures that guarantee housing as a human right, are saying, wait a minute, we have more rights for capitalists. And this, they're saying, this is unconstitutional, what you're doing, right? And the other line is, you know, we don't have the money to buy back these, these 
these apartments. We just don't have the money. We're broke under austerity. We can't do this, right? And there's a very real debt break in Germany imposed on uh, city-states, on, on Länder like Berlin, um, that say you can't go above this percentage. You know, this is it's imposed from the EU as well, right? So they're using that legal mechanism to get away from moving forward with this. But there's absolute political pushback with this nationalization process. Now, here's another thing that the Berlin state has done. In order to depoliticize this movement, they've introduced another rental price cap. I say another because they've introduced many, but this one's pretty severe. They freeze uh, rent in the private rental sector, not social housing, which, as we know, some of the rents even higher than the private rental sector, for uh, five years. To effective January 1st, this year, 2025, they've frozen rent. Now, landlords are crazy, angry with this, and have gone to the federal level, and now it's being uh, discussed as unconstitutional. We'll see what the final verdict is. But law is not neutral. Law is created, from a Marxian perspective, by a capitalist state, in the interest of capital, not in the interest of people, right? ordinary people. Um, so very much so. Yes, let's do this. But you know, neoliberalism just doesn't operate just on, on you know this freedom of flow of people, etc. It's a highly um, legalized structure, which has also limited the amount of political scope to challenge the status quo, right? As well. So again, we have to bring the state in. We have to look at these legal structures and say, you're not neutral. Let's bash these legal structures and rewrite them. If we rewrite them and actually in ways that are accessible and can be fought in court, then we can make housing truly a human right. There's absolutely no question that we can't do that. But we also have to have our analytical eyes on focus on what we're also going to struggle against. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. okay. Last two questions, perhaps. Do you have any, anyone else ready? Yes, one there and one here. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it's very interesting. I'm curious about the agency of the displaced people themselves uh, mm -hmm. in this situation. What are the forms of resistance they, they can take or that they do take? Um, like for example, uh, in my uh, voluntary work with refugees in, in Serbia, I've met people who mm -hmm. are uh, avoiding uh, living in uh, uh, UNHCR refugee camps mm -hmm. and instead they, they preferred uh, squatting in different places around uh, the town. Um, and I seen that a bit as a kind of political declaration that people prefer to live even in worse condition without an access to food rations, but mm -hmm. uh, without also this like surveillance and really dehumanizing way of managing the refugee camps. Okay. Okay. Can we'll take the other? So, did you have one too? Okay. So, two more questions after that. Um, should I go? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, this might be a very general question. I don't know, but I was just wondering whether you, in your research, had also focused on like how this impacted or possibly like benefited the elites or like the, you know, like whether you can link any of these policies or these initiatives that have been taken with detrimental effects for the housing as being like directly linked to the interests of, I don't know, like big financial actors or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one more. <laughs> We're keeping you sharp today. <laughs> Thanks so much, Suzanne. It's Faisy. Um, that was a brilliant talk. Um, I just thought it was more of a sort of comment and, and to sort of get your comments on this comments. Um, just the sort of um, the absurdity of, um, of the depth of the housing crisis and, and what people have to do. I had the bizarre experience the other day of accompanying a friend to a property auction. And there, I mean, you know, lots and lots of rich people. I mean, houses are going for two million pounds and lots and lots of poor people where, you know, houses in outer London are going for, you know, three bedroom maisonette or three bedroom, you know, Victor terraced houses going for a hundred thousand pounds and things like that. But, you know, the, the, the sheer kind of uncertainty of it, the, the, the sort of crass, you know, being able to like, uh, bid on a hot, on some, on something that is, 
that really is in reality a, a, a basic human right that has really been turned into a commodity to the to the greatest extent, mm. um, and people buying. Uh, buying uh, land so that they can just get the ground rent from mm -hmm. that. So they're not even buying the actual property. They're just getting, they're buying the ability to collect rent. So that, I mean, that's a kind of another, another sort of dimension. But I mean, it's, it's as you say, um, and I was very struck by, by what you said about Red Vienna, and this is exactly it, right? We just missed a, a Jeremy Corbyn government uh, in this country last year where they promised to build a million, ho a million affordable homes over 10 years. I mean, so really it is a political question because we now are... You know, we now are saddled with another, well, hopefully not five, five more years of this Tory government, but I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> no, exactly. But, but, you know, we had that chance. In, 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 imagine the sort of, the, the kind of effect that it would have had on, on, on millions of families to be able to access that sort of, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but to move towards a social democratic um, mm. dispensation where, where at least you can afford a home where, you know, people on 50, 60,000 pounds a year still cannot afford a home, you know, in, in London, like, or, you know, a, a, a decent kind of whatever, two, three bedroom home to raise a family and whatever. So this is, this is the sort of, I think, depths that we are sinking to in a society where housing as a basic human right in reality has become um, a commodity to be sold yeah. on the market. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Those all three. Excellent. I, commodity is a place of survival and a site of accumulation. In the old Marxian debates, they also said housing was really important because it's where we socially reproduce our workers. Right? And that got me thinking, and of course we had to update and gender and race and everything else have, have to be brought into the older Marxian debates. But it was really interesting in the sense that they were also at that time discussing in the 60s, 70s, home ownership, right? And that was the main tenure, you know, in the UK as well. Um, and it just got me to think, again, that's why I went back to sort of financialization. And, you know, I even used, I used financial capitalism. I thought, you know, we got to start taking this apart. And yes, it's capital and labor. But what is it about, you know, I'm not the first one to say this, but what is it about a type of capitalist that has not been around since like several decades, right? It's, it's, this is what we have here. It's not, you know, a temporary. Um, I'm not saying it's permanent, but it's been around longer than Keynesianists, or, or, or Fordism has. And what is it about a type of capitalism, um, societal mode of production, or uh, social reproduction, if you will, that creates all this massive wealth and at the same time creates, and you know, Marx talks about this surplus population of which it keeps growing and growing and growing. That it involves, we don't have a middle class, right? But what is the upper middle class? In Canada, the upper middle class is the top 5% income earners, right? There's no middle ground, it's just more and more vulnerability, precarity, right? There's no social safety net, so to speak of, and that. It, it, it's insane. It really is. And so then when I started looking at housing going, you're taking away from renters the only place of social reproduction. The only thing that I can come up with is to say that the people, the low-wage people, or so-called middle-wage people, I don't know if they exist, that are living in these houses are only, are, that are being displaced from these houses are disposable. They're not important. They're not important to capitalism. Right? The ones that are in the houses in Vienna, the Austrians, right, that earn the top 20%, they are given housing as a human right. Right? And so what I'm seeing too is a lot of um, sorting, uh, uh, fragmentation along gender lines, and in, in Vienna and Berlin, definitely along racialized lines. Um, and so I'm seeing a lot sinister, more sinister sort of understanding of capitalism than financialization can ever tell us, right? And the understanding of land as a commodity with the use value and exchange value is also really important to bring in line with that. And it's unfortunate that Christopher couldn't be here for the talk um, because of the strike, which is important, but um, he would have then extended on this conversation from the perspective of the land. But does that make sense? I mean, it's this huge, it's a sinister, uh, you know, I don't like the disposability. I've never liked that. I, you know, the surplus population too 
the type of accumulation is interesting if you have the heterogeneous sort of dimensions to it, et cetera, right? Nuanced, dynamic, and it's all relative to what, um, right? But there is maybe we have to say that some of us, many of us, are disposable to those that are there, right? And in countries like the US and somebody from the Bay Area, you have like what Kant talked about, prison fare. You make money through this situation where you stick them in prison, right? Um, and you, you, you warehouse those bodies, right? Um, and the other question about uh, benefiting, who's benefiting, I mean, that's an interesting aspect as well. You know, I talked about the poverty industry where we see this. So refugees living in emergency shelters and, and, and uh, communal shelters are paying the price for these rents through the jobs, the federal job centers, through social assistance or housing allowance, if you will, right? They're paying these private landlords, right? They're making a mint through taxpayers' money, right? In essence. And there's no democratization of that social surplus that already possible that's necessary for the right to the city, if you will. So people are benefiting from it, right? This whole um, situation, you know, and it, it, it's, it's, again, it's very nuanced. There's this story in Neukirin with the um, 2015, a, a very wealthy Syrian dentist, uh, and very racialized, so the Mig Migration Commission office in Neukirin, very racialized language, but this, um, this uh, Arab woman, he called Arab woman, <laughs> who was a, a professional, bought lots, you know, lots of property she could in Neukirin. She knew the refugees were coming in, and she transformed these uh, private buildings into uh, dormitories and started charging per bed, you know, the price that the, the, the government would pay, right? And she demanded way too much. The government only paid a certain amount, and she wanted more. Um, and, you know, she started kicking the refugees out. And it, it's crazy, but, you know, filled up the spaces with other people. So there's money to be made in, in, in poverty, absolutely, and finance is right front and center of this, right? Um, and so capitalism, capitalists are, are wonderful, they create destruction, I mean, that's the strength of capitalism, right? But the other strength of financial-led capitalism is the power of money, these concrete abstractions that can occur, Harvey and Marx talk about, without limit, right? But underneath all that, that lovely virtual that we can't understand, which is another aspect of their power, right, is also the state giving them, from the EU to the national, the urban level, all this uh, legal infrastructure to maintain that power, if you will, right? I don't know if that answers your questions, but it's, 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 it sort of runs deeper than just evictions and homelessness. Right? When we sort of situated against the larger dynamics of capitalism. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Thank you for your presentation and also for handling all of the questions so well.